Well, so that's where David Blaine got his sinful idea. Damn you, DreamWorks. What's more upsetting, a raccoon comprehending coin values in order to dispense his favorite chip, or a snack vendor woefully neglecting this roadside machine? I mean, look at the lack of inventory. RJ opting for convenient junk food rather than foraging for forest food is believable, but he's willing to scale a mountain before checking the picnic tables and trash cans nearby? How many times have you gone hungry in the basement rather than go upstairs to make food? You don't scale the stairs if you haven't checked under the bed for a partially eaten Luna bar. Where the f*** did that massive grappling hook fishing rod come from? It wasn't in his bag beforehand, so is this gonna be one of those cartoons that does whatever the f*** it wants? RJ is incredibly accurate with this fishing rod. You would think he would turn his attention to a nearby body of water and use those skills to fish. You know, for food. The chance of this paddleball string stretching to reach this root is about as possible as a man satisfying his girlfriend when she tells him to go deeper. Look, I'm well aware this is a cartoon, but looking at this wagon, how the f*** did he get everything to stay in place while he wrapped cords around it? And just because you show me that there's a half-assed blanket wrapped around roughly 16% of the items on this cart doesn't make me confident the gambit worked. Also, are we assuming the bungee cables came from his golf bag of holding? Or did the cave have all the convenient items he needs for this heist? In which case, what use does a bear or raccoon have for an inflatable raft? Also, also, movie drastically overinflates the abilities of this raft. Holy sh that wagon just stopped on a dime after being launched 20 feet in the air. This movie suggests the bear has a can of potato chips in his arms, even though he clearly didn't before RJ made his jump. It also didn't come off of a wagon full of goodies because nothing fell off, and even if it did, it would require the discount Pringles can to become sentient and maneuver itself into the sweet embrace of a sleeping bear. <laughs> Tiniest noise wakes up the antagonist after the protagonist has made tons of noise cliché. <laughs> First off, what the f*** is this truck honking its horn at? Second off, why can't the truck get in the other lane to avoid the wagon? They have no problem changing lanes when I'm trying to pass, and they have somebody ahead of them going a fraction slower than they are, so smashing into a wagon full of snacks should be avoidable. And don't even think about running away, because if you do, I will hunt you down and kill you. Does a bear do gangster s*** in the woods? Saving three cents. Man, even on the cooler and lawn equipment, you're saving three cents. Not sure if this is a joke or if this store is being disingenuous with its savings, or if the animators are just lazy. During RJ's entire life as a hungry raccoon looking for food, how has he missed this giant neighborhood that's this close to the foraging zone? Although honestly, as we're about to find out, this neighborhood apparently sprung up literally overnight. So maybe I should give him a pass for not noticing this before. Nah. Oh, oh, that's cold! That's cold! Wait, did they just recently have snow everywhere and now it's full-blown spring? If this turtle's been hibernating the whole time, how has he not been showered with melting snow like this? Come on, everybody, wake up! Don't make me come in there! Y'all better listen! I've been holding something in all winter, and I'm about to let it out! If Stella had the power to make everybody wake up, why did she wait until Vern got irritated to do something about it? That isn't Stella a part of the group of animals that wasn't waking up? Also, what would kid movies do if they couldn't rely on hilarious potty humor? Well, he is kinda pokey. Yeah. Yep, he's the sharpest of the bunch there. It's good to see that even in animated movies, Eugene Levy and Catherine O'Hara are required to play a married couple after the Best in Show Accords were passed in the year 2000. This means we were nine berries away from starvation. But after you gave the possums two berries, there are eight berries on the branch, so that's at least ten berries. And then when the movie cuts, you have ten berries on the branch and the possums are still holding their two berries. Then after giving the porcupines, the squirrel, and the skunk a berry each, the branch is somehow empty? Right on the tip of my tongue! Oh yeah! There's a weird thing over there I've never seen before. It's really scary. Follow me. Steve Carell is a f***ing delight, and his vocal performance here brings a smile to my dark soul. All hail Steve Squirrel. Hammy, what weird thing? Jesus Christ, how long was this winter? How did the new neighborhood build a never-ending hedge in just a few months? It never ends. It's gonna be crazy later when RJ walks on top of the hedge and they find out their whole world is shaped like a Mobius strip. That's a deep cut for you Arthur C. Clarke fans. It never ends that way, too. The idea that humans would spend the time and money to erect a perfectly healthy wall made of a living plant rather than slap up a wooden fence and be done with it forever is probably the most ridiculous part of this entire movie. Let's call it Steve. Nepotism. The exact place where they walked up to the hedge has a convenient hole for exploring purposes. Imagine my disappointment when I went to research irrigation systems that shot jets of water anytime they were slightly disturbed and discovered they do not exist. This is the first of several severe turtle survives this moments in the movie. Someone on the animation team is really working out some childhood turtle trauma. What was over these there? freaky pink primates? The yard flamingos that did nothing are foremost in Vern's mind. Makes sense. They must have come while we were hibernating. Sure, during the winter, a small army of builders got all the houses built and prepared for all the people to move in all at once. We will be fine as long as no one goes over Steve again. Through. You mean through, Steve. 
except for that little bitty speck. You are here. Which creates several questions, like how did RJ manage to find our forest friends in the first place? Or how does he plan to take the food through the neighborhood back to the forest without being seen? Or why is he worried that the bear will find him when he's in the middle of suburbia? Turns out they pretty much retconned this statement by the end of the movie and firmly showed that they are in a forest after all. And for that roller coaster of bullshit, I salute you. John Tesh. He's just now opening the chips that he was desperately hungry for. Just now! Honestly, I've been skeptical about the appeal of this snack, but after watching how many chips RJ is distributed to be eaten, I would go through a lot of trouble for a snack-sized bag of chips that contained this many. Gladys pulls a box full of food out of her car that's apparently been sitting there since she drove home earlier in the afternoon. I have the sneaking suspicion that she left that box there so RJ could prove that the humans have food everywhere. That gets the food hot! That keeps the food cold! That... I'm not sure what that is. Amazing all these examples of what humans do with food are happening at this time of night, including a bunch of kids smashing a pinata. They put it in gleaming silver cans just for us. And they don't use trash bags, they just throw loose shit in the cans. Night, Ozzy. Good night, Bert. And so the nocturnal creatures bed down for the night, because that makes total sense and nobody will question it. Oh! Ah! Night bears. Oh yes, because you really need to consult a picture of a red wagon to confirm that a red wagon is actually a red wagon. The manual tells these girls not to panic, get away from the animal, and tell their parents about it. So what does this girl do? She goes right in for the attack. And that's how you lose a World Thinking Day award. I don't know, I just looked up a bunch of Girl Scout awards and that one stood out. Nocturnal creatures sleeping at night, squirrels that burp their ABCs, I can handle that. But showing a turtle without its shell, which is in fact part of its body, is straight up the dumbest shit ever. Hammy, <laughs> you are awesome, my man! In high school, someone sprayed pepper spray in the hallway before an assembly, and half the population of the school coughed for hours without being directly hit. So how is Hammy functioning after a can of pepper spray was unleashed on his face? He was, he was right over there! Despite looking directly at Vern, none of the humans seem to care that he's there. Because this, my friends, is just the beginning! Curious, considering just last night everyone agreed it was too dangerous to go into the neighborhood. Sure, sugar can change their minds, but is anyone but Vern remembering being beaten by a broom or sprayed with mace? Then when RJ had an actual plan to get the Girl Scout cookies, it barely worked. But now they're experts at acquiring not only food, but stuff that's not even from the trash. This lyric to this Ben Folds song says, Where pink flamingos grow, diet soda flows. And that's a funny lyric, but these assholes aren't stealing anything diet in this movie. Is that a pizza that's stacked vertically in the back of the truck? If that's the case, you deserve to have your pizza stolen. What is this bullshit? One card poker? What? By the way, the very idea that RJ knows every single item that they needed to replace from Vincent's cave is some total bullshit. First, none of these items are food related, and second, by now there should be a large tunnel through the hedge lined with bare twigs. Do you ever feel like someone on the production team is asking questions like, yeah, but how did the printer print a picture if there's no electricity, and then they were fired for asking? Mother! Is that you? Beckoning me into the light? Ah, tale as old as time. The animals all speak in their own tongues, but it comes out English so we the audience can understand them. But the animals understand each other and the humans. And the mystery of animal-human communications in movies remains a mystery. Also, what does the turtle sound like when he's talking in his own language? I personally guarantee that there will not be a living thing at this party. Except people, right? Do they get to live? <laughs> oh really? Do you in fact have an associate's degree from Firm Tech? Movie makes a joke about this guy's questionable education, but everything about him suggests he's a genius about verifying animals. So movie's gonna stomp all over the joke before the scene is even over. Your new home. How is any of this a surprise to RJ? Do you really think these animals went out and stole stuff without him knowing it? Or ever seeing it and wondering what it was? Also, why exactly do the other animals think RJ needs a wealth of human comfort to live with them in the forest? I feel like all of this is to make Vern more jealous, and to make it more understandable to a human audience, but RJ doesn't need any of this Check this out. We totally hooked up the TV. I hotwired the HC converter. Because of course you suddenly know how to make human things work to your advantage and run power to your tiny patch of nature. Vern is clearly trying to deal with his concerns about RJ, but he's also choosing to starve his family by returning all the food. Are we sure he's the good guy? Vern, what are you doing? I'm getting things back to the way they were. By starting in a totally different yard to allow the maximum amount of shenanigans. You leave and I return this stuff to the rightful owners. I know Vern doesn't know much about how things work, but I honestly can't see how he thinks he can get each individual thing back to every owner. Did they keep track of what they stole and from whom? No! Play? If you think this dog would have waited until hearing a chew toy to come out of the doghouse, you've never interacted with a dog before. Nobody in this neighborhood hears all this commotion or multiple fences getting busted down. And before you say, well, the movie just isn't showing it, take a look at this dumbass, completely unaware until the chase gets in his backyard. No! Oh yeah, sure. Only just now is the point where you're screwed. Vincent clearly said you needed to get back all his stuff to not get killed by him. I doubt a stack of not Pringles was going to sway that. We like worked our tails off, you know? Like a lot. And the food we gathered was totally, you know, and you're 
you're all whatever. I don't know what to send, teenagers or a screenwriter's attempt at writing a teenager. Don't you understand there's something wrong with this guy? Vern is right, but I haven't heard him provide an alternate plan. Before RJ showed up, their main conflict was that their once bountiful forest had been knocked down for a neighborhood that got built literally overnight. So where were they going to find food? If he found a natural food source, his argument would carry more weight. I'm starting to think that little tingle of yours is just you being jealous. Presumably, these critters have all been hanging out surviving together for years. They know about Vern's tail tingle, and earlier they reacted to its activation reverently. But the story needs tension, so f*** all that history. Uh-huh. And who the hell snapped? That picture. Is this supposed to be one of the chips that got crushed by the cooler a minute ago? Man, this exterminator's been asleep on the job for the last five hours. What was he doing during RJ and Vern's crash and burn through suburbia? As it is illegal in every state, except Texas. Everything's legal in Texas, cliche. Wait, does this trap have settings for different animals? All it does is set up a laser grid. Why would that be any different for rabbits, mice, or raccoons? And of course, there's a goddamn bear icon on this thing. Why not? Bears are one of suburbia's most oft-cited pests and not related to the plot at all. Adios, animal infestation. This woman owns a house cat with a door to the backyard, so it's basically dead, right? Laser grid kills and traps the teddy bear, even though it's set to rabbit. Like Ben Folds used to sing, give me my money back. Also, if you laser a critter to a crisp, why also trap it in a cage? Is death not enough? You the lady throwing the party? What the f*** kind of delivery man brings all this food at this time of night unless it's so RJ can eavesdrop and make the rest of the movie happen? What is the point of this thing? Is what every screenwriter who puts a turtle in their animated movie says without ever looking it up. But where did they get their miniature cow, cart, and truck? It's from the f***ing golf bag again, isn't it? And where is the overhead light coming from? Can I be the car? I want to be the car! Monopoly. You, Stella, will get that cat to give you his collar by using my stink. Your feminine charms. Oh, so this cartoon thinks that the Pepe Le Pew cartoons are something you can try and emulate in real life? No, wait, I heard myself say it. Doesn't mean I won't sin it, though. But I'm looking inside, Stella, and I see a fox. Skunks and cats sleeping together, mass hysteria. Don't you dare! And so parents everywhere left the theater knowing that there was a 63% chance their children just learned about butt plugs. See, kids, the moral of the story is that in order to be beautiful, you should look nothing like your true self. Too bad you look more like a squirrel than a cat. Oh, not again. Dang it. Those things are so lifelike. Yeah, but first off, that's a flamingo, which is rarely ever a yard pest. Second off, you could tell what animals were in the area by smell a minute ago. Are you a bumbling exterminator or are you good at it? I can't figure it out. Maybe this is a new fishing pole, but I choose not to believe that. Anyway, this fishing pole was used to climb the cliff where Vincent's cave was, and when RJ was done, he left it hanging on the cliff because the hook was still lodged in the rock. As we all know, RJ never got that pole back because Vinny chased him down the cliff, and I highly doubt he climbed that rock again just to get it back. The point is, I'm kind of a dick, but I'm right, unless he somehow stole a new fishing pole, in which case I'll sit it now and not be sorry later. No, 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 Hammy! I told you that cookie's junk! You mean the cookie you barely threw over the hedge earlier? That cookie? That went all the way to the roof of this house? You know what? Go f yourself, movie. No one has ever spoken to me like that. It is bold. I like it. No one has ever spoken to me like that, but I love it, cliche. What the f show on TV would play a THX logo? He sure as f didn't start a DVD player. The only thing on the table is this TV and my suspension of disbelief. This way, this way! That THX logo is going way longer than any THX logo has ever gone before. Somehow, filling this wagon took longer than two hours, when RJ did it by himself in less than three seconds earlier in the movie. STELLA! A street cat named Desire. Behold the enchanted binoculars of viewing. Instantly see the nearest plot development with a plus 25 bonus. You keep this up, you're gonna end up just like me. Having everything you ever wanted. You mean, if he keeps stealing food for a bear and selling out his friends, he'll somehow end up with the food? I don't get this line of dialogue at all. Through the wonder of editing or something, RJ isn't flattened by this van. Oh look, the cages have all magically opened. Sweet, we won't have to worry about RJ finding a key or anything because the movie took care of it for him. So Vern falls on the Verminator's foot, which causes him to press the gas pedal. Now in normal situations, this may rev the engine a bit, but in this loony over the top movie obsessed with receiving the extra award in the They Survive This category, the gas pedal is pressed permanently to the floor forever. We're out of control! Something I wish the writers would have realized about 30 minutes ago and corrected. Animals driving the car. Look, I know Finding Dory and Toy Story 4 and The Secret Life of Pets all came out after this movie, but I'm tired. This movie is stealing from all those movies. I'll turn myself in at the fact police tomorrow. I'm like they're Otis from the Andy Griffith show. You're the one who always says, trust your tail. But it's not tingling. Oh. Why didn't you say so? Probably because it didn't matter the last time he told you.
Those porcupines are driving recklessly, but there is no way they are driving nearly 100 miles per hour. Yeah, I guess you're getting some kind of revenge here. For the record, you guys were in the wrong to steal stuff from her in the first place, but I digress. You guys are totally about to die, and all you're thinking about is, man, we sure got back at her. Ah! Oh! The old jazz dance injury. Yeah, it's probably the only thing that would really flare up after a 100 mile an hour Humvee flip into the top floor of the house that broke through the floor and crashed into the downstairs kitchen. Gary Clown. Oh, so Vincent piloted the helium balloon exactly where he needed to go? He's got experience with that. Cool. Now let's just check it. Jeez, maybe we didn't give enough credit to Over the Hedge for doing shit before the movies. This is the Quicksilver stuff we love so much from X-Men. Kind of admirable. But then it shows him being faster than the speed of light, and while the kid inside me is like, yes, the black hole of my heart is a place where even sins can't escape. Damn, there goes HBO again. <laughs> They're gonna die of radiation poisoning. <laughs> What was the point of that massive heat ray if all that trap was going to do was lock them in a cage? They should be dead, right? I found my nuts! And you kept that a secret until now because... The end credit scene shows that the rest area does occasionally fill their vending machines. According to the beginning of this movie, they only fill it when they're completely out. They're probably stocked by Truman's asshole buddy from The Truman Show. I'm gonna get you the giant picnic pack, family fun size! Loop over here, and I think I can shed a little light on what this whole hedge situation is about. See, what was once a little bit of spec, you ah, that's because you wanna open it. ding in your head when you watch movies? I hear it all the damn time. Especially around the holidays. And I'm done hiding my damn dings. I'm gonna wear them proudly. Like a goddamn YouTube Grinch. If you want to do the same, you can grab this limited edition monstrosity from our store. Merry Dingmas, everyone. Cans! Oh my god! Oh my god! There was no bigger, it was full of cans! There's gold in the Federal Reserve and they took a load of it. She was very popular back then. She had dozens of boyfriends. Hundreds. Hundreds. Yeah, hundreds. I did not know that. We were supposed to kill two birds with one stone, destroy a piece of corporate art, and trash a franchise coffee bar. The chip. Yeah, Bert. These chips are good. No, Kelly Clarkson. What does God need with a starship? You're the devil. I can't lose Christine Miles. I just, I can't. I can't lose Christine. You're a cat. You're a cat. Now, check me out. You did it. He shut down the earth.